we've got here is a perfect combination of two of my favorite subjects. AI and automotive design. Hey there, everybody! Welcome to episode number 548 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Why, yes, we are talking about AI and automotive design this week. My guest is Seth DeLand from MathWorks, and we're delving into the world of AI modeling for automotive applications. We're also talking about the common challenges that automotive engineers face when implementing simulation into AI modeling, and the ways that simulation can help with integrating, implementing, and testing AI model components. So, without further ado, please welcome Seth to Fish Fry. Hi, Seth. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about automotive applications and specifically why data preparation is a crucial step in the AI workflow during model-based design for automotive applications. Yeah, that's a great question. So AI models, of course, they need data for training them or for validating their behavior. And so data is really key to the whole process. Um, The other thing with AI models is we have this saying garbage in equals garbage out. So if your data is bad, you're going to get a model that's bad. And so it's really important to prepare a good data set before you move into the steps of training those models. And so that could involve things like bringing in your data and labeling it. So adding what we call ground truth labels, things that you're trying to predict to that data. And oftentimes that's going to involve some domain specific workflow. So say I'm working with images, then I might be you know labeling regions of an image that I'm trying to predict, or maybe I'm building an AI model that's going to work on audio. I would tag regions of an audio clip that I wanna predict. And so that whole process of kind of bringing your data in, labeling it, getting it organized is really key. The other thing that you can do during that step is identify maybe gaps in your training data, maybe cases that you were hoping to be able to predict, but that you don't have much data for, or quality issues. Maybe you don't have as nice of data as you thought, and that could lend to maybe needing to go out and collect some more data, or possibly even use simulation to synthesize or generate data where you have those gaps. That makes sense. Now, How does simulation influence and impact the design of AI models within the automotive industry? And what do you think are the best practices that simulation brings to the development of automotive AI models? Yeah, so so simulation is really core to model-based design, right? This notion of we are going to do uh, as much simulation early on in the design process to understand how components behave, how systems behave, how systems of systems behave. And so simulation has really become core to automotive development workflows. The more that you can do in simulation, the less that you have to do on real world hardware, which is both faster and a money saver for engineering teams. Now, when it comes to AI, those AI models that are being deployed to run on the vehicle, they don't exist in isolation. They're going to have to interact with the rest of the electronics and the rest of the systems around them. So simulation can be a great way to take that AI model integrate it with the rest of the the logic or the system and understand, well, how does this AI model actually perform when it's integrated with all these other components? And one example of that, if I was, say, um, building an AI model that can predict the battery state of charge, so like, do I have a battery that's you know, 80% charged or 90% charged or needs recharging, that type of a thing. I could collect some data and I could build an AI model that makes that prediction. But then where the rubber meets the road is really, how does that model work now when it's integrated with my battery management system, the rest of the control logic for operating the vehicle? And so I would want to run simulations there of how that model interacts with the rest of that system. So, Seth, what do you think are the most common challenges that automotive engineers face when implementing simulation into AI modeling, and how can they overcome these challenges? Yeah, so I guess there's two key areas where we see a lot of interest in combining AI and simulation. One is around this application we call virtual sensing, so this notion of I'm using an AI model to 
estimate some quantity on the vehicle that I can't directly measure or that's really costly to directly measure. And battery state of charge is a, a good example of that. We've also seen people applying these AI models to estimate like exhaust gas concentrations in the tailpipe when they're trying to make sure that their emissions are clean. And so this whole notion of virtual sensing, where you're trying to build an AI model that measures that quantity, you often have to compare it to the previous design, right? Because these aren't completely untackled problems. Often companies or, or vehicles will have some existing strategy for trying to estimate or measure this. And so, you know, you're really going to want to give yourself a, a bit of a framework where you can compare AI models to the previous design. And then you're also going to want to understand how it perform on the actual hardware. I can do things like simulation. I can run that on my desktop and get an initial feel, but the hardware resources on vehicles are, are often quite limited. And so understanding, well, how is this AI model going to actually be implemented on the actual hardware is another challenge there. And at MathWorks, we've always had a big focus on automatic code generation. So being able to convert control logic, advanced algorithms and AI models and included, and being able to take those from the engineer's development environment, MATLAB and Simulink, and convert those into lower level, say C or C++ code that's going to actually run on uh, vehicle hardware. And so that automatic conversion is really focused on enabling engineers to be able to see how does this model perform when it can actually run on the hardware, and then being able to generate eventually production code from that model as well. And so that challenge, though, can really be a big barrier because historically teams have taken these AI models that maybe somebody has designed in a, a higher level language, and then they've recoded or re-implemented them in order to get them onto the vehicle hardware. And that's a manual step in many cases. And so if every time I make changes to my AI model, I have to hand it off to somebody else who re-implements it that can be a really big challenge as well. So there's definitely some challenges associated with that virtual sensing application. The other kind of high level application where we're seeing AI and simulation combined is around reduced order modeling. So this notion that as engineers, we often rely on physics-based models in order to model the environment or the system that our algorithm is going to be running in. And those physics-based models, they can be quite computationally intensive, meaning they often take quite a long time to run them on computers. And so this whole notion of reduced order modeling says, well, what if we could approximate that physics-based model with an AI model? And the AI model might not get everything exactly right, but it might be accurate enough that I can use it for my design studies and I can run it a lot faster than that physics-based model. So I can explore a lot more of the design space. And so when you're doing this type of approximating a physical system with an AI model, one of the key challenges there is, well, how do I generate data from the existing model in a way that gives me good coverage of the physics-based model's operating envelope and that gives me a sufficient amount of data to train that AI model? So here we're actually seeing a lot of folks resort to traditional techniques like design of experiments and other design space exploration tools to generate data that can then be used to, to train those AI models. So that's a challenge that we see for folks applying reduced order modeling. So Seth, let's talk about how simulation can help with integrating, implementing, testing AI model components, and then reducing hardware costs as automotive engineers integrate AI into vehicle systems and R&D workflows. Yeah, that's a great question, Amelia. So I think breaking that down a little bit, you know, the, the simulation is really a key environment for testing the AI model. And so it, it really gives you confidence that that AI model is going to work as expected when integrated with the rest of the system. And there's various levels of simulation too, right? So oftentimes groups will start with model in the loop types of testing where they're, you know, doing this all through simulation and they might do software in the loop where maybe they're generating code for the algorithm and understanding how that generated code Act when it's interacting with the environment. And then we also have moving to hardware, things like processor in the loop or hardware in the loop, where we're actually going to generate code and deploy it to hardware that's realistic and representative of the hardware that will be on the vehicle. And so kind of by going through these different levels of simulation and in the loop testing, it really helps me understand how the model performs at various levels through the design cycle, and it can help me identify issues early. So that's really kind of key to simulation, but it's shown to be very useful for implementing these AI models as well. Now, shifting over to the second part of your question about reducing hardware costs, 
So in the, the virtual sensor application that I talked about earlier, a key motivation for building in an AI-based virtual sensor is so that you don't have to add additional hardware sensors to the vehicle. It's this notion of, well, what if we could use the existing sensors that we have and use an AI model to estimate some of these quantities from those existing sensors that we had? So any time that you can have that type of conversation about, well, what if we could replace a hardware sensor with software, that's going to mean reducing hardware costs on the vehicle. One example of a, a customer of ours that spoke recently at an event was um, from Stellantis, and they were talking about using an AI model to estimate the NOx concentration in a tailpipe, right? Because they, they want to estimate NOx at various stages of the exhaust gas after treatment system. And so they were looking at other sensors that they had on the vehicle and actually showing that they could do a reasonable job estimating that NOx concentration. Now, Right now, they haven't quite been able to replace this particular NOx gas sensor. They haven't been able to replace that quite yet, but they are um, currently kind of running this virtual sensing model as a redundancy type of an, an application. And they're they're looking to say, well, in the future, is our sensor accurate enough that we could actually completely replace that hardware sensor with software? Another part where this notion of reducing hardware costs comes in is in the AI models themselves, right? So. AI models really can span a wide range. You know, you could have simple regression types of models that are maybe even under a kilobyte that, that can take up a pretty small amount of RAM on their memory on the vehicle, all the way up to today's deep learning models can be in the range of gigabytes. That's not uncommon. And so when you're talking about adding that much memory to a vehicle, that's a substantial hardware cost that you need to run that model. So one of the areas we've actually been focused on is model compression. And this involves different techniques, things like pruning, quantization, where you're saying, okay, I've trained an AI model already for a particular task. It's achieving an accuracy that I'm happy with, but now can I make it smaller while still getting the same accuracy out of it? So can I reduce that memory footprint? And so these techniques like pruning or quantization have been shown to effectively reduce the model size while maintaining accuracy. And, and that can translate into significant cost savings when you're talking about reducing memory on the vehicle. Seth, what kind of automotive applications do you think could benefit the most from simulation? And can you share some examples that MathWorks is working on in this arena? Yeah, sure. So I think powertrain controls are definitely areas where simulation is very strongly adopted in the automotive area. And so model-based design there has really enabled teams to handle the complexity of having many different vehicle platforms, variants, models, and, and everything that goes into building powertrain controls for all those different uh, scenarios. And so, but I think there's a lot more opportunity in other groups that are starting to adopt AI as well in, in other parts of the vehicle. And, you know, a couple of examples of those that we've had recently. So I mentioned the Stellantis example, working on the exhaust gas after treatment system. We also had a conference where Goshen talked about their use of AI for estimating battery state of health or battery state of charge. Again, using an AI model as a, a virtual sensor to, to estimate what's going on on the battery. And so I think there's a lot of untapped opportunity out there where teams are kind of understanding AI's potential and its capabilities and figuring out that, hey, if we could estimate this quantity with AI, then this is really opening up new doors for what we can do in terms of observing what's going on in the vehicle and then making controls decisions as a result of that. Actually, one of my favorite recent examples comes from Mahindra Truck and Bus, and they actually gave a really nice presentation on estimating road condition from other sensors on the vehicle. And so, you know, am I driving on a deteriorating road that has lots of potholes or very nice, new, smooth paved road. And for their large trucks or buses, you know, being able to understand what type of a road you're on means you can actually optimize your control strategy and run the vehicle in a much more fuel efficient way, depending on that scenario. And so I think there's still a lot of opportunity for innovation out there as teams ramp up on this AI technology and understand what it means to their applications. That's super cool. Now, Seth, what do you think the future of AI for simulation in automotive applications looks like? Yeah, so I think there's a couple things going on. I think we're continuing to see a lot of automotive engineers upskill in AI. So, you know, look at taking some courses, some training courses online or, you know, ramping up on the tools. And, and we've definitely had a big focus at MathWorks for 
providing a bunch of different options for them to take, you know, everything from small one to two hour training courses up through full instructor led courses to ramp up on AI and understand the technology. As a tools provider, MathWorks, we're continuing to look for ways to make it easier for folks to use and build these AI models as part of their workflows. A lot of that has led us to more domain specific AI, where we're looking at what does it mean to apply AI to different types of data and how can we provide tailored workflows for applying AI to that data? So you think about different types of data, even just on a car, you know, you have everything from time series sensor data for things like engine speed and lots of other sensors. You now have cameras, so you have image data or video data, you have LIDAR data, uh, maybe radar data. So there's all these different types of data that are really being used. And we're, we're looking at how do we provide these end-to-end -end workflows that are tailored to applying AI on those types of data. And then the other thing I think that's coming up in the future, and, and that's a, a big focus for us as well, is what does it mean to do formal verification and validation of these AI models? And so there's a lot of industry groups out there that are looking at this, trying to address the problem of how do we ensure that these AI algorithms are being implemented in safety critical systems in the correct way. And so those groups are hard at work on standards and understanding what needs to be done there. And, and I think there's going to be more coming on that front as well. Right now where we're at, we have algorithms for things like explainability and interpretability that can help demystify a bit of the black box nature of these AI models, but there's still more work to be done there to really help people understand these models more completely and understand how they're going to perform in the real world. That is super cool. Thank you so much for joining me, Seth. But before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff. So since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off the cuff. So Seth, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? Oh, I would probably head to Naples for a pizza. That's uh, That sounds pretty nice right now. <laughs> I love it. It does. Awesome. Well, Seth, this was really great. Thank you so much for joining me. Yep. Thank you very much, Amelia. It was my pleasure. Also, if you'd like more information about the super cool stuff that MathWorks is doing in this arena, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this week's episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash slash EE journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of September 8th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>